This week, Parliament finally voted to enact Article 50 and start the Brexit process. It marked the end of a long and bitter struggle by lawyer and troublemaker Gina Miller to put a break on the Brexit process by taking it to the Supreme Court. And after months of painstaking legal work, death threats and the Daily Mail calling all judges enemies of the people, she finally got what she wanted. Two days of speeches in Parliament before they went ahead and voted for it anyway. <laughs> Hang on, was that it? That's the shittest version of Erin Brockovich <laughs> ever. <laughs> But the debate did demonstrate what a difficult situation our MPs are in. Let me explain. You see, MPs face four conflicting pressures when voting on Brexit. They've got the wishes of the nation, the wishes of their constituency, the orders of their party, and, of course, the voice of their conscience, as well as pressures from the media, their family, and their own 12-point career plans. Now, this might seem like an impossible situation, but there's a very simple way of navigating it. You merely have to adopt an Australian-style point system. For example, let's say your party is imposing a two-line whip in favour of Brexit. That's five points. However, your constituency voted against Brexit with a slim majority. That's minus four points. Personally, you feel that Britain would be better in a reformed EU. That's no points. And the Daily Mail is threatening to put a picture of you and your home address on their front page under the headline, Death to All Traitors if you vote against. That's 77 points, which all adds up to 78 points. A clear mandate to vote leave. So, how are the parties supposed to keep their members in line? Well, they all had very clear guidelines on how to vote. Labour, having fought an election on the promise to stay in the EU, as it would be a disaster for the country, then said that we should leave the EU as that's what the country wants, even though it's not good for it, unless it is, which it might be, unless it's Theresa May's version of Brexit, which it will be, except we don't actually know what that is. So in summary, Labour MPs should vote for Brexit, but only if they feel like it, and unless they're Diane Abbott, who decided to stay home with a cold. The Conservatives are even clearer. All MPs must follow the wishes of the 52% and vote for Brexit, even if they don't believe in it. Their constituency doesn't believe in it, Theresa May doesn't believe in it, and all their mates in the city are getting ready to pull their money out of the country and stick it in a lock-up in Panama. You see, Tory MPs have the luxury of not having to vote with their conscience because, of course, they don't have one. The Lib Dems policy is that the country's vote for Brexit was just a horrible mistake, which is why all of their nine MPs voted against it on Wednesday, except the two who didn't, because Tim Farron couldn't organise a fucking piss-up in a pond full of Jägermeister. There's also one Green MP and one UKIP MP, but they basically cancel each other out in Parliament, so most of the time they don't bother voting and go for lunch together. Last week, Caroline Lucas wanted to go to this new vegan quesadilla place in Dalston, so this week... Douglas Carswell is taking her to his local Legion club for some port scratchings and a go on the Operation Wolf arcade game. Anyway, the good news is they've all voted now, so hopefully everyone will shut up about it for the next five years. Panel, was this all a colossal waste of time, Marek? Well, I spent uh, most of my time watching all the fallout of it, mm. trying to work out what David Davis's middle name is. <laughs> <laughs> I wanted it to be David, David <laughs> Davis. That would be great. That's all I wanted. But apart from that, um, it's quite difficult to work <laughs> out what's going on, isn't it? So what I try to do to explain it to myself, mm. I've likened the whole um, situation to a student kitchen. Yeah. And Britain has come along and done a shit in the kitchen. And all the other students don't want Britain to use a kitchen anymore because it's done a shit on France's garlic, etc., etc. et, cetera, et cetera. Mm. But Britain owns the microwave. Uh -huh. And what's happened is they've got to work out whether they still want to use the microwave. But no one's got any other power apart from Germany, because Germany owns the cooker and the fridge and all the utensils. Okay. So does that explain the whole thing to you? It kind of makes sense. <laughs> Would you use the microwave, Holly, in those circumstances? I'm confused about the circumstances we're in. But what I would say is, I like the way that, for once, the MPs were voting with their hearts. Oh. Do you know what I mean? I just loved that speech from Ken Clark. Oh, wasn't it lovely? I just, <laughs> at the end, what I would have liked for it, if you'd bent down and got out your saxophone. Yes. You know, I'd done a bit of Baker Street. Yeah. I would have topped it, it would right off. Yeah. 
Jeff, did you like that performance from Ken Clark? It really livened what, things up, didn't it? What I quite like as a Conservative voter is having to see Liberal left types enjoying the words of Conservative. It's quite yeah. rare. We mm. saw it through the Brexit debate as well. You had friends that were retweeting David Cameron. I think they probably had to go and shower themselves afterwards. It's been a, a confusing it's, political it's time. It's funny how the frame has moved. For mm. the, the new baddies mean the old baddies seem all right by comparison. Well, it also proves is that Tories are capable of uh, compassion yeah. and not being complete arseholes. There's, there's one I'm sure that there are others. Um, I mean, I also voted Leave as well, and I think everybody, it's going to be fine. I mean, somebody, was it David Davis that said Britain's best years are still ahead of us? I think that's a, quite a big shout, given the empire and mid-90s Britpop. I think it's going to be hard <laughs> to eclipse a lot of that. But one, th one thing I would say is I'm trying to be a reasonable Leaver, right? And this 1.8% this majority is not a big majority, no matter what way you want to dress it up. I almost think, like, if you, if you had your BMI checked and you were just inside the normal range, you wouldn't go out and buy a muscle top, would you? So let's not, <laughs> let's not claim that this, is a, this isn't a stunning mandate. It, it's, it's a win. Which part is in the biggest mess over all of this, Marek? I think the Lib Dems. They're just lost in the abyss and they haven't got enough support. I mean, I don't know what you think of the, uh, the Lib Dems as the, the sort of middle ground. The Lib Dems are in a mess. And also, the, the SNP are in a kind of logical paradox as well, yeah. in that they want to break away from a supranational state to be run by a much bigger supranational yeah. state. They claim that it's not political, and then they table 50 amendments to a bill which they don't even know what it includes yet. And I was thinking, if you, if you want it to seem genuine, you don't say 50, because that's suspiciously round. You go 46 <laughs> exactly. amendments. We go, well, that must exactly. be genuine. It's like it's, doing a tax return. It's, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Is you always keep the numbers yeah, in the you keep, yeah, yeah, always fill in the pence. Yeah, always fill exactly. in the pence. Keep it plausible. I mean, there is, apparently there's some SNP purists that want to be both outside Britain and both outside the EU, and I think that's a fascinating and insane position. Oh. Panel, thank you.